next on Lectures in History. Emory University professor Deborah Lipstadt teaches a class about anti-Semitism in America and Holocaust denial. She shares the story of her 1996 lawsuit against Holocaust denier David Irving, which was turned into the 2016 movie Denial. She also outlines answers to frequent claims made by deniers. Good afternoon. Um, what I'd like to do today is start by contextualizing for you Holocaust denial. I'll talk a little bit about what happened to me during my trial, but first I want to talk generally who are Holocaust deniers, uh, why do they say what they say, and how can we understand what's doing um, uh, or what's what their arguments are, their so-called arguments are. Uh, but I think we have to begin first by uh, defining the Holocaust, you know, getting a, a sort of basic definition. There are many variations one could have. How, how would you define the Holocaust? How would you define the Holocaust? Don't, don't all freeze up on me. How would you define the Holocaust? Uh, we, we went over this briefly before in class. Uh, we went back to the... Uh, Greek root of the word holocaust. Holocaust right. means total, and then cost meaning uh, uh, to be consumed by fire. Like so caustic, it, right, right, exactly. It's a more popularized term to describe the Hebrew term for the actual event, which is Shoah, right, for right. the utter destruction of the Jewish people. Okay, the utter destruction of the Jewish people by whom? Nazi Germans. The, the, the Third Reich, the Germans. Um, it's not all the bad things, terrible things, horrific things the Germans did during the war. The Germans did many horrific things, killed millions of people. Um, had they won, they probably, this is counterfactual, we don't know, because of course they didn't win, but had they won, they probably would have killed millions more. They probably would have wiped out many people whom they considered useless eaters, you know, just consumers not producing anything. They might have wiped out um, all homosexuals. They mainly persecuted uh, German homosexuals, but they would have, may have eliminated all, wiped them out, killed them, murdered them. Uh, they might have uh, murdered people in many of the workers in the Ukraine, just leaving enough agricultural workers to produce uh, food for the Third Reich. But those are all, that's all speculation. The Mongols, because of the, you know, uh, connection Mongols to the idea of uh, what used to be called Mongoloid or uh, what today we would uh, call uh, children with developmental disabilities. Um, but all those things could wait till after the war. The one thing that couldn't wait that happened during the war was the attempt to wipe out the Jewish people from one end of Europe, the Netherlands, you know, Denmark, all the way through uh, into the Soviet, well into the Soviet Union, and then North Africa, Libya, and aimed at other uh, North African countries where there was a large population of Jews. Rhodes, the island of Rhodes, Corfu, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and what makes it... I mean, we know of other genocides. There are other genocides. One of the most famous genocides, and too little talked about genocides, of course, is the Turkish genocide of the Armenians in the uh, time of World War I. Um, and that, that's and which is denied also by the Turks. The Turkish government denies that there was a genocide, so there's a parallel there. Uh, but in any case, um, most genocides are against a specific people within a specific area. For instance, the Turks were not out to kill Armenians who might have been living in Berlin or in Paris or in any other place in Europe. They wanted the Armenians in a specific area in Turkey uh, murdered, destroyed, removed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In this case, um, in the case of the Holocaust, as we know from the various memoirs we've looked at and discussions we've had over the course of the semester, um, it was men, women, children, irrespective of whether you posed a particular threat to the German regime, and inside Germany and well outside of Germany. And in fact, the mass killings begin outside of Germany. 
They begin with the uh, Einsatzgruppe and the mobile killing units in early 1941 um, in uh, former uh, in, in Soviet territory that the Germans took over, Germans captured. Um, so it's, it's different from it. Again, it doesn't encompass all the horrific things that, that were done in the name of Germany during the war. Um, but it, what, what, the reason it captures our attention is it's this, this unique, and unique can't be modified. You can't say somewhat unique, a little unique, very unique. Something is either unique or not unique, right? Okay? So this unique attempt to murder an entire people irrespective of age. I mean, people were wheeled, were wheeled to, the, to the deportation uh, trains. We have pictures of it on gurneys, you know, because they couldn't, they couldn't walk, they couldn't sit. Uh, baby carriages, et cetera, babies carried into the gas chambers. Um, irrespective of age, irrespective of gender, irrespective of whether the person posed a threat to... Germany and a sensible threat to Germany. Um, so what deniers are denying, Holocaust deniers are denying, um, is that this happened. Not that there weren't lots of bad things hap that happened and bad things. As one denier that I interviewed um, said to me, bad things happen in war. Yeah, one side kills another, one side bombs another, one side uh, in for, uh, unfairly imprisons another group. Uh, so this is no different. But one of the things that you see, they'll, they'll, they'll engage in what I like to call immoral equivalencies. We often talk about moral equivalencies. These are immoral equivalencies. <clears throat> so they'll say things like, um, okay, so uh, the Germans had concentration camps. That was well known. That when Dachau was open, they had a press conference to announce the opening of Dachau, and lots of the other, and lots of the other camps were well known. Um, but the Americans had camps, too. Who did the Americans have camps for? Germans. Actually, that's not entirely correct. Who did we have camps for? Actually, we had camps for... Hmm? Japanese Americans? That's exactly right. We had American citizens of Japanese descent. Different. Because you could say foreigners, but yeah. Alex? Did they also have camps for POWs? Well, we had camps for POWs, but that's a norm. We had camps for POWs. The sad story of the POW camps, and many of them were in the region we're sitting in right now, here in the South, was that uh, in the camp, there were camps for officers, P uh, German officers. And in many camps, they were treated better. They had more freedom of movement than American soldiers who were black. So, in other words, the officers could go into town, and African-American uh, soldiers were often told by their commanding officers, you're not allowed to go into town. So it's, it's, it, it, but a POW camp is a norm. A prisoner of war camp is a norm, Alex, for um, in, in, any in a course of a war. But these are, we're talking about camps for civilians, camps for non-combatants, Okay. Um, so they'll do something like that. They'll say, uh, oh, well, um, the Germans bombed London in the Blitz, but the Allies bombed Dresden. They'll find all sorts of, you know, you did bad, we did bad, let's all sing Kumbaya, you know, and, and set it aside. But there's no immoral equivalency for this attempt to wipe out an entire people. That, that stands alone. So there is this uh, effort to deny it. Now, Holocaust denial begins quite early. And in fact, uh, uh, let's say Brazil and Panama, not, not Argentina. Um, but in Argentina, which was home to um, quite, a, quite a number of uh, escaped Nazi war criminals and a, a very loyal, um, loyal to the Third Reich German expat community, um, they refused to believe when, when Adolf Eichmann, one of the chief executive officers, uh, chief operating officers of the Holocaust uh, told them about what happened. They refused to believe it. They, and in fact, many of the early denial materials were produced there. Some were produced in France. And there was early denial in the 50s and the 60s. But Holocaust denial, the, the denial that I've looked at and the denial that I've studied, the denial you read about in uh, History on Trial or denial, whatever edition of the book you had in the, in the, in the movie, um, deals with later denial. Um, and it le deals with denial that begins to emerge about the mid-70s. 
And it's very, it has a certain parallel. Alice, you and I earlier were discussing white extremism today, contemporary white extremism. It adopts many of the same tactics. Um, what deniers figured out, and, and deniers are very often closely linked to white supremacists, um, white power groups, et cetera, mm. like, et cetera. Uh, or if you go on the websites of white power groups, white supremacist groups, you will see Holocaust denial material there. Um, they figured out early on that uh, if you praise the Third Reich, praise the Nazis, if you did that, if you, ta- if you walked around in, you know, pseudo kind of Third Reich uniforms, or you were photographed giving the Sig Heil salute, the German salute, people would look at you and say, oh, those are extremists. We don't, we don't want to be associated. The extremists repels. That's why the racists don't go around mar- marching around in well, white bed sheets, you know, with Ku Klux Klan hoods on. Because we all recognize that extremist and, and we're repelled by it and we stay away from it. Um, but they figured out that if they got rid of the outer um, telltale signs of extremism, of pro-Nazism, of neo-Nazism, and garb themselves in more uh, traditional, acceptable, non-extremist wear, people wouldn't be repelled by them. So instead of calling themselves deniers or saying we're anti-Semites, we hate Jews, and we think what the Germans did was terrific or whatever, um, they adopted the name revisionists. Revisionists, very, sometimes you will hear deniers uh, referred to as revisionists. And they, what they want to say is, we're not denying anything. The only thing we want to do is revise mistakes in history. That's why an institute they created in the mid-'70s was called the Institute of Historical Review, a journal they, cre- they published, the Journal for Historical Review, Review. In other words, we're reviewing mistakes in history. That's all we want to get to. History makes mistakes. We understand things differently, etc. But the only thing they looked at was the killing of the Jews, Um, And it was hardly revising of mistakes, but it was denial. Uh, Denial that—and they they denied—each one is a little different. There's not one overwhelming or uniform template to apply to all deniers, but there's certain things that are common to them. A, to deny that there was a plan by the Third Reich, led by Adolf Hitler— directed from Berlin to annihilate the Jews, okay? So that if any Jews may have been killed, and often they'll use the word died, you've got to pay close attention to language, uh, they, uh, it was rogue action, you know, individual action. Some officer got out of hand, shot a bunch of Jews, some uh, soldiers burnt a synagogue, but it was nothing organized and not centrally directed from Berlin, A. B, um, the number six million victims is totally made up. It's an exaggeration. It can't be proven. It can't be uh, documented, etc. C, anything wrong that was done was not done under the aegis of Adolf Hitler. So again, it goes back to the rogue actions. These were out-of-control officers or, or things like that. Um, what am I up to? C? D? D, right? D? I forget. Um, ga- and then a big focus on gas chambers. Now, the gas chambers are scientific impossibility. Gas chambers would have exploded. Ch- gas chambers never happened. They were, they were really fumigation units. They were air raid shelters. Any one of a number of different... Um, examples of what they were other than purpose-built killing machines. Now, um, just for a moment, um, I want to contrast, I want to make a point here that I think is important to recognize. Um, The Germans killed, murdered 
with the help of uh, Lithuanians, Latvians, Ukrainian the militia, et cetera, et cetera, in different places, um, well over a million Jews. In fact, we'll look at some of those documents in, in a little while. Um, but they murdered them. They shot them. They took them out to pits that had been dug, shot them, and, and buried them in the pits. Uh, we have witness, eyewitnesses to this. We have the physical evidence, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the re, the, and, and the deniers do focus on that and do try to say, well, that was no, those, that was a killing of partisans, of people who were spies, of people who were rising up against the Germans. Of course, it doesn't explain how their own documented lists show how many Jewish children are killed, how many Jewish women are killed. If you're killing spies, you're not killing children, you know, and you're not killing in the great number that they killed. Um, but the reason the deniers focus so much on the gas chambers is that you have shootings in many wars. You have shootings of, of, of uh, civilians in many wars, not usually in the number of well over a million and in the short time span that this happened. But the gas chambers were, and, and, and you died in one, you died in the other, the death is horrific. This is not comparative pain. I, I, comparative pain is a useless exercise. You know, if I had walked in here this morning and said, oh, my God, I have an a impacted root canal, and someone here had said, oh, I have two, I wouldn't have felt the least bit better. So, you know, compare, sometimes people get in, my pain is worse than your pain, my people's pain is worse than your pain. I think that's a, it's a nonproductive, useless uh, road to go down. Um, but, but the reason we focus on the gas chambers is the gas chambers were purpose-built killing machines. A gun could be used, a gun can be used to get food, a gun can be used for protection. No matter how we feel, you might feel about guns, they do have purpose other than killing. Gas chambers have one purpose and one purpose only, and that's to kill people. And to kill them efficiently, and to kill them using as little um, fuel as possible and to kill them in a way that will, uh, in a manner that will make them compliant, you know, not so they won't all go crazy and start fighting. So you create, you know, oh, just hang your clothes over here. Remember where your clothes, you hung your clothes so you can find them when you come out. Uh, putting shower heads in the, in the gas chambers or things like that to deceive people so they'll, they'll be more compliant. And, but the deniers, realizing that there's no immoral equivalency for gas chambers, go to great efforts to deny them, to say they were scientific impossibility, ignoring um, reams of evidence, uh, some of which I'm going to show you in a little while, um, on a website called HDOT. We'll, we'll look at it in a minute. Um, so that, those, that's the basic arguments of deniers. No plan, no, uh, no six million, uh, no lead, not leadership from uh, Hitler, no gas chambers. And the last point is that this was all made up by Jews to get sympathy from the world and to get reparations. And in that sympathy on the first point, and that sympathy on the, from the world, to get themselves a state, a Jewish state. Now, I want to stop here from the uh, details of denial for a moment and, and uh, posit for you and explain for you why um, I consider, and it seems eminently clear to me and many others as well, Holocaust denial is really a form of anti-Semitism. Because what it's arguing is that the Jews made up this myth, made up this story of six million killed. And then not only do they make it up, you can make up a myth. We could sit around here and make up lots of great stories. We'd walk out of this room and nobody would believe us and people would just look us up like we're weird or something we make if we make up some story. But they managed to make up this, this unbelievable, incredible story and get the world to believe it, get the allies to help them plant evidence, get the Germans, who were innocent, according to deniers, to pay 
billions in reparation and even more than the money they were being paid they were paying in reparations you know uh, uh, money paid to the victims and to the families of the victims etc um, to bear a burden of having done this to bear an ethical burden because today even today Germany when when Chancellor Merkel uh, decided a couple of years, three, four years ago, when it was to open uh, uh, Germany to quite a few refugees, um, I think it was a million, um, many of them were already there, but part of her reasoning was that we as Germans can't turn people away. So it's that if you go to Germany, you spend time in Germany, that burden of what happened. Now, some people fight it, some people ignore it, some people fight against it, etc. But, but somehow, if, if this never happened, to get Germany to accept it is quite a thing. For after all, think about this. For deniers to be right, who would have to be wrong? For deniers to be right, who would have to be wrong? Okay, the victims, all the people who say, this happened to me, this is my story, my family disappeared, my wife, my children, my parents, my uncles, aunts, cousins, neighbors, etc. I, I saw them being shot, or I saw them being taken off to the gas chambers, never to reappear again. Okay, so that's one, one group. Who else would have to be wrong? Governments. Governments, okay, which governments? I mean, for example... The German government. Okay, that the Germans themselves, the perpetrators themselves, when they say uh, it happened, that they're making that up. Who else would have to be wrong? Facts and truths. Okay, there is. That's a very good point. Um, there is no narrative. There is. There are no witnesses saying it didn't happen. You know, we didn't see it. These people were taken and are all still were taken to this nice place to live in this nice place. There's no, there are no documents. So what, what deniers do is they have to debunk the documents that do exist showing it. Alex? So aren't they essentially conspiracy theorists? Yes, yes. They are, they are conspiracy theorists, and that's what anti-Semitism is, is a conspiracy. Th- but yes, they are conspiracy theorists making the point, just one minute, making the point that... Um, this uh, small group of Jews was able to get the Allies to plant this evidence, hold the Nuremberg trials, hold subsequent war crimes trials, get the Germans to pay reparations, all these things because of the power of the Jews. So that's, that's why we consider it a form of anti-Semitism, because it plays into all the tropes of anti-Semitism, the financial you know, shenanigans of the Jews, uh, the power of the Jews, the, the manipulativeness of the Jews, et cetera. So it's all there, right. Um, who else had, yes? Like in the case of the events like the Holocaust and other ones that like indisputably happened, would you consider revisionists to be the same as deniers? Yes. Oh, okay, let me go back to that. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, so they call themselves revisionists, but you'll see in, my, in, in the book, in, in History on Trial, or Denial, as it's now called, um, that I don't call them revisionists. Because revisionism, for those of you who are history majors or will be history majors, um, you're going to learn that revisionism is a respected mode approach to history. If you were to go, we're in the library, if you were to go up to the library and find a history of the South, American South, from 1952, maybe even 62, or earlier, it would have very little discussion of the life of the African American, either as a slave or later as a free person. It would have very little information on Southern women, black or white, so what, what a historian today would do is take that period and revise and think, well, well, if we add the voice of the slave or the voice of the freed African American or the voice of the woman, how does our understanding of history change? I'll give you another example. Uh, after World War I, it wasn't called World War I then because nobody knew two was coming. It was called the Great War, or depending on where you lived. Um, the Versailles Treaty, the Paris Peace Accords, um, were seen as a great accomplishment by 
if you took a history class in 1965 as opposed to 1925, or even 75, 85, 95, whenever you were taking your history classes, you learn about the, all the flaws of the um, uh, Versailles Treaty and the Paris Peace Accords. The great financial burden it put on Germany, on Weimar Germany, on democratic Germany, um, the creation of little states, the, uh, all sorts of things we, which we won't go into now. That's a revision of history. That's looking, you, you ask different questions. We look at a, a historical event and we ask different questions. So revision, in, in terms of general history, is a very respected, it's, it's one of the um, uh, operating motifs of any historian. So that's why they're calling themselves that. But they're really not that. They're deniers. Matthew? And they will often, um, they will often look back to early like legitimate historians who would call themselves revisionists right. and they would say we're in that lineage we're that's doing right. the same that's thing right, right? That's so they exactly. try to legitimize that's exactly their right. approach to denial right. through that through historic mm -hmm. revision right Mika? Then, then do these actual legitimate uh, historians who uh, subscribe to the uh, school of thought of revisionism do they distance themselves from this oh, everyone there are no serious historians in the ranks of deniers there are, yes, yeah, sometimes you'll get a professor, then you learn that he's a professor of, I don't know, astrophysics or not, not no, no one else, but you know, that they're in a completely different field. No serious historian subscribes to this. Where it has gotten traction is um, amongst um, certainly right wing, far right wing extremists, anti Semites. And then it begins to get traction today. I mean, for a long time, we really thought that it had diminished markedly. But it begins to get traction today in other ways, in, in sort of softcore denial. What, I, this is, what, we've been talk, what I've been talking about until now is hardcore denial. Softcore denial, which was, oh, it wasn't so bad. Bad things happen all the time. Why are you complaining about it? Or uh, you'll get... People who were once formerly res very respectable people, the former mayor of London, Ken Livingstone, a guy from the far, far left, who will say, well, yeah, it happened, but the, the Zionists cooperated with the Nazis and, and made it happen because they wanted uh, the Jews to come to Palestine. So it, it has no legitimate grounding, no legitimate historical data, but you'll get that kind of thing as well. So in, there is, or the Poles, in Poland today, uh, as of a year ago, a little over a year ago, uh, they passed a law that says you can't, uh, and we know which law, you can't talk about the Polish people as collaborating. Now, po the Poles are, not, because they wanted, we were only victims. There were many Poles who collaborated with the Germans. There were many Poles who rescued Jews. There were many Poles who helped Jews hide. There were many Poles who, who turned Jews in. But Poland wants to be thought of strictly as victim. We were not we did not collaborate in any way. So that's not the hardcore denial I'm talking about, right. but it's more soft, what I call softcore denial. Yeah, Alex and then Zoe. So when, when you say that they were not taken seriously, it's, it's very different to the book where the denier is shown as someone who's Taken seriously. He's taken seriously by the media and the historians in right, general. Right, right. The, the, not very few historians subscribe to his, you know, uh, talking about the case of what happened with David Irving. Um, let me hold off on that a minute because I'll, I'll get into it in a more constructive way. I just, I was gonna ask okay, the same thing. Okay, so let's turn to that for a minute. Um, uh, my story, as as many of you know from the memoir, in which which you're reading, et cetera. Um, I wrote a book in 93, 19, published in 1993, on Holocaust denial, attempting, I was just intrigued by why was the media, some in the media taking it seriously? Why were people paying attention to this? Why were, and on campuses you would find people saying, would say things like, oh, it's the other side of the story. Well, you know, you, there, there's a saying that uh, you can have your own opinions, but you can't have your own facts. Um, I don't call Holocaust denial an opinion. In order to be a Holocaust denier, you've got to look at the evidence and lie about it. So I say there are facts, there are opinions, and there are lies. You know, the earth is flat. It's not an opinion. It's a lie. You know? um, 
but uh, sometimes you can have a, a, a wrong uh, that uh, you can think the earth is flat just because you've never been exposed to things. But in order to believe in Holocaust denial, you've got to really ignore reams of this evidence, some of which we've gone through. The, doc the Holocaust has the dubious distinction of being the best documented genocide in the world. Um, and, so, and the perpetrators, no perpetrator in any war crimes trial has ever stood up and said it didn't happen. What they've said is, um, I didn't do it. I was only following orders. I had no choice. But not, it didn't happen. Okay? Um, and then you have the people in the villages around the death camps, Trev the town of Treblinka, uh, the town of Asvichim, who saw the trains going in day after day filled with people coming out empty, who knew what was going on there. There wasn't much they could do about it, but they certainly knew what was going, going on there. And the victims, of course. Um, and the historians. If For Holocaust deniers to be right, the, the, the thousands of historians who have written on this topic in the United States, in Canada, North America, in South America, in, in all the European continent, in Israel, in, uh, I don't know, where else, uh, Japan. I was in Japan and met with scholars working on, on you know, the uh, uh, rescue of Jews there, Sugihara, and other, other aspects of um, the Holocaust, etc. They would all have to either be in on the, on the dupe, on this uh, uh, trick, or have been duped. It doesn't make sense. So what happened to me? What happened to me is in 1993, I wrote this book trying to examine this phenomenon and arguing that it's a form of anti-Semitism. Um, and in the book, I made brief mention, I think if there are 300 words devoted to him, it's a lot, um, of a man named David Irving, who was an author of many books on history, when you look at them closely, you can see they don't deserve to, he doesn't deserve the title of historian because he ignores evidence, perverts evidence, etc. Um, and I argued that he knew the facts and he twisted them. Now, there's some deniers who don't know the facts. When someone, you know, if you have a propensity to believe that Jews are evil or Jews will do nefarious things or diabolical things, and someone says to you, oh, they made it all up because they wanted money from Germany, you would say, oh, you know, because if you've grown up in the Western world, and not just the Western world, you have a template of anti-Semitism, just like you have a template of, if you're white and you have a template, you have a template of racism. It, it's there. You've just grown up in that petri dish with those kind of things around you. You know? Um, so I wanted to explore this phenomenon, and I mentioned him briefly. And I talk about the fact that he had become a denier. He'd become a denier when people weren't paying his money. He, he likes to do outrageous things and say, make outrageous historical claims. And at some point in the late 80s, he had become a denier. He sued me for libel in British courts. The reason he chose the British courts is because their libel system is the mirror image of the American libel system. In America, if I say, you libeled me, uh, I have to prove that you libeled me. You told, the, you told an untruth about me. In Britain, if I say you libeled me, you, as the author of the words, have to prove the truth of what you said. Yeah. How could he just sue using the British? Because of the, court, the book was sold in Britain. It went on sale in Britain. It was a British edition. So I was considered to have done business in Britain. And once you engage in a commercial enterprise there, you're liable to their, to their laws, including their libel laws, two different kinds of libels. Um, in the book, it mentions a lot of the financial cost of mm -hmm. uh, the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. How did he manage to pay for everything? Because this he wasn't had, his first lawsuit. He, first of all, he had supporters. Uh, he had many supporters uh, amongst, you know, white supremacists, amongst, you know, I know there were some Saudis who were offering him, him money. Um, he told the court that. At one point, um, but we never we never quite tracked that down. We never really attempted to track that down. Matthew, I just want to highlight how that all went down because people often get that wrong, saying that you sued him. Right, that's is often how people frame it. Right, many people even back in that time, people framed it that that's way. That's right. That, right. Many know. people just assumed I had sued him. Why would you pick this right. fight? Right. I mean, I history. Mean, I, I don't believe history belongs in the courtroom. The way of judging, adjudicating things in a courtroom, in a legal context, and the way of adjudicating things historically is, is, is quite different. And I don't believe you go suing people. He sued me. And, but, but Matthew's point, thank you, Matthew, is a, very, is a correct point. Many people just assume, oh, she must have sued him. So in any case, 
So he sued me, and we took a very... Um, some people say that this trial was about proving the Holocaust happened. It doesn't matter. It really wasn't about that. I, when I sat down with my lawyers, we, we, we were both on the same page in this regard. But we said that, you know, we don't have trials to prove that uh, World War I happened. We don't have trials to prove, I don't know, the, the, the Civil War happened in the United States or, or whatever, whatever. Why do you need a trial to prove the Holocaust happened? And that's not what we're about. My book wasn't about proving the Holocaust happened. My book was about looking at deniers. And David Irving says he wasn't a denier. He's not a falsifier of history. He doesn't lie about history. He doesn't deny the documents. So what we did, and should be of interest to any student of history, is we followed the footnotes back to the sources. In other words, we weren't proving what happened. We weren't proving how many people precisely were murdered in Auschwitz or any other camp, or murdered by the Einsatzgruppen. But we were arguing that when David Irving says, at one point, I think he says, only, only 64,000 people died there, died there, that, he, that the evidence he was using doesn't prove his point. So in other words, we were, going, we were following his claims to show that he engaged in distortion of information, distortion of material, false claims, etc. Yeah. Um, this is kind of similar to Alex's question earlier, but since Irving was seen as a historian, and like if you're a denier, mm-hmm. essentially you can't be a historian, how is it that so many respected scholars and professors saw him as a historian, and even your lawyer at first didn't <clears throat> want to claim Mafia. that he wasn't? Right. We, we didn't want to make the claim because we thought it was a, 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 you know, a swamp. You couldn't, we wouldn't be able to make clear to the court you know, in that sense. But the more we looked at his information, the more outraged we were by how he openly distorted material. Um, but there aren't, there weren't that many. People thought he had a propensity for finding documents that weren't otherwise known. He would find documents, he'd go to Germany and someone would give him a diary and someone would give him something. And so they weren't so much, over the years, they became less and less taken with his claims about history. For instance, he wrote a book called Hitler's War, came out in the late 70s. And in it, he said, it's the biography that, it's the autobiography that Hitler never got to write. I put myself, I'm paraphrasing here, I put myself in Hitler's shoes, he says, and I wrote this biography. In it, he argues that Hitler never knew about the Holocaust, and when he heard about the Holocaust, he tried to stop it. Um, that's what he writes in, in the late 70s. He, he revises the book in the late 80s, early, ni- early 90s, and then all mention of the Holocaust disappears. So then it's not only that Hitler had nothing to do with it, but it's, it's gone as being mentioned. But historians were interested in the documents he found. You know, so it wasn't that he had so much respect, but that he had a history for suing people, he had a history for being very litigious, and I, of course, was one of his victims in that sense, yeah. Um, so you, you briefly touch on this in the book. You mentioned how at first he starts not as a full-on denier. Mm-hmm. And he gradually falls into right. this denying. How do you think that happens? How do I think that happens? Um, here I'm speculating. I don't know for a fact. But it seems to me that um, as time went on, he was getting less and less attention. People were saying... What's this craziness with claiming Hitler didn't know about the Holocaust? What's this, you know, extreme view of one thing or another? And um, it was a way of being, it, it seems to me, a way of being outrageous, of getting attention and, and winning support. He was, when he would go to the meetings of the Institute for Historical Review, he was like, you know, hail the conquering hero. They loved having him come there. So that's, that's the only explanation. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the Institute for Historical Review and how it tried to look like a Yeah, legitimate... well, it looked like that. It's, it's an important point because it, it, it resonates with some of the things we're seeing today with extremism. It would have scholarly conferences. And if you looked at the program, oh, this looks like a scholarly conference, and you know, you'd glance at it or whatever. But if you look closely, you would see it was all about denying uh, the Holocaust. It would, have, it would publish journals. In fact, there was a student at Yale... I believe it was at Yale, um, who wrote his senior thesis on some aspect of the Luftwaffe, the uh, Third Reich um, uh, Air Force. 
and he went to the library to say, and his, one of his teachers said, this is really good, you should think about getting it published. So took himself off to the library, the Yale Library, um, went to the journals, just to look journals on World War II. And he saw a journal in historical review, a journal of historical review, I forget the exact, what the exact title is. Um, and he said, oh, I'm going to send it to them. And he sent it to them, and they accepted it immediately and published it right away and sent them a check, I think, for $300 or something like that. So when someone told me the story, I said, well, he should have known it wasn't a legitimate journal. A, they accepted it right away. You know, historical journals make you wait forever. B, they published it right away. Again, a, a clear sign that something's at, we're missing. And they paid him. So, you know, um, but he, in other words, he was easily duped by this. You could be duped by these kind of things. Uh, or the newspapers would report it, and someone would go and say, oh, this sounds legit, et cetera. So what we did, what we did is follow his, the, the evidence back to the sources and show how he twisted. If you bring up one of those, uh, um, yeah. this is, okay, before you do that, this is a website, Holocaust Denial and Trial, on trial uh, available now in French and Spanish. Espanol. I know we know you can do it in English, but you know, it seems to be available in, in uh, we Russian, hope in Arabic, and yeah. and Farsi. Farsi. Um, and this is based. This is an Emory-based website, Holocaust Denial on Trial. H D O T H dot is for short. Dot org. It's an Emory-based um, uh, website with its own portal for security reasons. It has all. If you go to the lower end, the far on the. Um, uh, right-hand side, trial materials, the witness reports, et cetera, uh, history on the project. But let's go to the debunking <laughs> Holocaust deniers, and let's go to the co just the different things that are covered in that. Um, so it's uh, to, uh, slow. Uh, Anne Frank, Auschwitz-Birkenau. Now, one of the big things that the deniers like to deny is the authenticity of the Anne Frank diaries. Now, you might ask the question, Why? You know, you're denying gas chambers. You're de denying six minutes. Why worry about Anne Frank's diary? Why do you think they might spend so much energy on that? Yeah. Anne Frank is one of the most popular um, diaries ever published in history of right. literature. It, not. Before Harry Potter, I think it was the second most published book, the most translated book in the world. Uh, the, the first, of course, is the Bible. Um, but, um, but that's exactly right. So For so many young people... The Diary of Anne Frank is their portal, their entry into this field. So if we can prove that's false, oh, you were tricked about that. You were tricked. We can prove about other things. So what they do, they say it's written in ballpoint pen, which it isn't in the margins in a couple of places. You know, the, the editor who worked on it first never thought that she or he, I think it was a she, uh, was handling something that would become iconic literature. An iconic piece of history. So she made little notes, margins in the notes, and green ballpoint pen. But the diary itself is in ink that has been tested um, and shown to be ink of the exact kind that was used in that period. Um, and about the annex, et cetera. But let's go to the... Um, uh, I, uh, let's go to the number of Jews. Let's go down a little bit on Auschwitz. Can I go down a little bit on this whole page? So you see other things where they uh, try to deny the authenticity of um, of Auschwitz Birkenau. Uh, they uh, let's go to that one Auschwitz Birkenau crematoria. German documents on the ovens. Okay, right there. Thank, okay, so what do we know about the capacity of the, crematory, the cremation ovens at Auschwitz-Birkenau? Here's the denier's claim. There are no authentic Nazi documents that address the capacity of the crematory ovens in Auschwitz-Birkenau. What they're trying to argue is that there are no documents that show that this, these, this camp could have, could have that, these oven, that these ovens could have burned all the bodies that were um, uh, murdered in the gas chamber. So this is about the ovens. Um, and they reject evidence. Go down a little bit. Um, there is an, a document that says uh, 40... Here we go, right here. Uh, 4,700 people could be... Um, 4,700 bodies could be cremated in a 24-hour period. Why were they so concerned about the bodies to be cremated? If you're killing people... The Germans were very concerned about typhus and other kinds of diseases. You don't want the bodies to pile up. You don't want the bodies to pile up. 
And also, what are you going to do when people are going to come in and they say, no, no, you're just going to the showers and there are piles of bodies or something? So it's almost like working backwards. How many bodies can be cremated determines how many people we can kill in the 24-hour period. So here you have a German document uh, sent by Karl Bischoff, the head of the Central Building Administration in Auschwitz-Birkenau, in charge of building and, and building of different units, etc., uh, sent um, to Berlin uh, detailing uh, how many bodies could be burned in each crema, crematorium. So in crema, and here you see the actual document, crema one, 340 uh, persons in the 24-hour per period, crema 2, 1,400. And if you have been to Auschwitz Beer Canal, um, when you go into, the, into Beer Canal, you go all the way to the back of the camp, you see the ruins of two crematoria. That's crema 2 and crema 3. In crema 4 and 5, you just see the, the floor of where it was because it was pretty much destroyed. But telling you the exact... Um, uh, number of people who could be burnt in a 24 hours uh, period. Um, so uh, four bodies in each, you know, a muffle, they call it a muffle, that hole in a, where you put the body in, four bodies, and then um, uh, over the period, 4,700 people uh, could be killed. So th that's already telling you, if, you, if you're killing, t you're able, you create a capacity to cremate 4,700 people in a 24-hour period, that's pretty striking. Now, David Irving, at one point during the trial, tried to argue, oh, but there was a typhus epidemic in the camp, and they needed to cremate bodies. But if you're cremating these many people, you know, that means you're repopulating the camp, they're re-getting the typhus, and, the, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. So that's how we argued. That's how we showed that his being... Because here you have the document, and it's showing exactly... Uh, what what was. Um, if you take us to um, the, Ein the Einsatzgruppe and we'll go to the, the mobile killing. So the estimate is uh, pretty slowly uh, 1.1 uh, million 50, uh, 1.1 uh, million uh, Jews, a little over that, were murdered by the Einsatzgruppen and their collaborators. Now, here's the Holocaust deniers claim. The number of Jews murdered by the Einsatzgruppen is lower than the million. Uh, they're possibly large. There's no statistic basis for uh, that claim. Um, research shows, and we have, what we have are Einsatzgruppen reports. The Einsatzgruppen, there were four major Einsatzgruppen, and then there were smaller units within them. And they sent back reports to Berlin on how many people they were killing. We have many of those reports. They were discovered in preparation for the Nuremberg trials. An American researcher just found this file of, of reports. It's an interesting thing, though, to stop for a moment and think about it. You're out... In a, killing people on the open fr on the on the Eastern Front, you're murdering people, and you write up a report detailing precisely how many people you've killed. We have copies. I think we only have one document in this one, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, here, it's right there. Um, that's the Jaeger report, and it, that's a compilation. Um, here, so here you have on the side the denier said the number of victims is impossibly large. But here you have the Jaeger report, a report by uh, a German officer, a uh, German general, on the number of Jews who have been killed thus far. Um, go down a little further, Matthew. So stop right there. Um, so here you have it. So Einsatz Group, he is it's a comprehensive um, study um, of how many people have been killed by each um, unit at, at, at a certain point in time. And if you go through all these reports, you come up with 1.1 million. But going back to the creation of the report, why would someone create a report you know, on this kind of thing. Alex? I mean, wasn't it that they were very bureaucratic, the German Okay, the certainly bureaucratic, but what else are you trying to say when you create a report, when you create a report? What else, why else would you be trying to create Robin, why else would you be trying to, why would you, why, what would be the motivation of creating a report? Yeah, as a uh, legitimacy. Okay, to add legitimacy, what else? To, to fulfill a task that was assigned to yeah, them. Yeah, the task, I, I did my job. I'm proud of it. Or, alternatively, the same reason, CYA, you know, should someone ever come and say, you did the wrong thing? I reported on it. 
Now, there's a very interesting moment in the trial where our expert on, on these, talking about these reports, um, Christopher Browning, a very prominent historian of the Holocaust, a very fine historian of the Holocaust, was on the stand. And David Irving was uh, cross-examining him. And he said, well, maybe they exaggerated the numbers. Maybe they blew the numbers up. Maybe the numbers are much smaller. And, you know, Browning said, yes, that's possible. And I'm thinking, he's supposed to be testifying. What's, what's he agreeing with David Irving for? But then he, then he added something which shows the illogic of Holocaust, of these, of these deniers. He said, yes, but if they're exaggerated, that meant that whoever was sending in the reports knew that Berlin wanted big numbers. You only exaggerate something when you know you're fulfilling, your, your, you're reporting to higher-ups. They want big numbers, I'm going to give them big numbers. So that's the kind of thing you... We pulled out the ground from under with logic and with documentation that showed that their claims that there are no documents, hello, here's a document. And when it came to the Nazi hierarchy, mm-hmm. there was the, there's this concept that historians talk about called working toward the Fuhrer. Right which means that often Hitler would kind of have a, a kind of un, very uncertain idea of what he wanted or sometimes a very certain idea of what he wanted, but he would kind of let his underlings kind of figure out how they were going to do it, right, without mm-hmm. putting his own... Get rid of it. the Jews. Right. Mm-hmm. right. And so people would often try to implement to, to prove not just that they had fulfilled their task, but that they had done it with efficiency. And there was, there was a lot... Uh, a large desire to really try and um, work toward the Fuhrer. You, well, everybody wanted yeah. to outperform the others. He wants to get rid of all these people. I'm going to figure out the, the most drastic way to get rid of them. Now, sometimes it was cooperation, like when we read our, the memoirs of, and, and the, the, the diaries pertaining to France... Um, sometimes, the, you know, in that case, it was the Germans wanted to deport the adults, and the French said, you know, take the children also. So sometimes they got support, for, but it, working towards, certainly within the German hierarchy, working towards the Fuhrer, showing that we can, we can uh, do these kind of things. We provided at least, I think, 35 different instances, and they're all in the, um, on this website, you can look at the... Uh, um, and transcripts bring up the section of the judgment and the last, the very last section of the judgment, page part. I think it's part thirteen. Um, so what we did is again not prove. At one point, you know, my my barrister turned to Irving and said, "Mr. Irving, I'm not interested in how many people were murdered at Beer Canal. I'm interested in proving that when you say it's only sixty four thousand, you don't have the evidence to prove it. Yet you're putting it out there as a claim." So not what happened, but that what David Irving as... And he's central to the denier's arguments, less so now, but he's central to the denier's arguments, part 13. Um, yeah, okay. Oh, you want to click on that? Um, or, yes, that's right. That's what I want. Um, whoops. Uh, uh, this is... Um, I don't know if you'll be able to find it, but I'll look up the source in just a moment. Um, the judge eventually finds this is the, his his uh, judgment was um, over. I think it's close to three hundred, if not over three hundred pages long. Um, but and if you, I wouldn't. You don't have to read the whole thing, though. He summarizes each argument, his argument, each each claim, our argument, his argument. But in the end, in this section. Um, he says uh, David Irving perverts, distorts, his view is misleading, unjustified, it's a travesty, it's unreal. He does it will, on purpose. He's, he's motivated by, by a desire to prevent events in a manner consistent with his own ideological beliefs, even if that involved distortion and manipulation of historical evidence, and he's a neo-Nazi polemicist. So that was exactly... What we, more than what we hope for in terms of um, uh, sh- showing him to what, for what he was. Uh, like right here in 1344, uh, it says, he, this yeah. is from the judgment, uh, it does not appear to me that in relation to these meetings, Irving approached the evidence with, in an objective manner, and then at the very end... He perverts uh, the, evidence. the evidence. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it was, it was a significant victory in that sense. It put the kibosh 
you know, sort of on um, hardcore Holocaust denial arguments, though they're, you know, people who have no sense of any of the evidence, et cetera, are st still try to make that argument. It hasn't put the kibosh on softcore denial in some of the ways that we talked about in the beginning. Questions, comments, anyone? I do. Um, yes. Do you, believe, do you think that um, David Irwin's attack on you was rooted in his uh, personal belief in anti-Semitism, or was he simply trying to... Why me? In other words, why me? Become popular, yeah. right? Um, that's a great question. I, don't, I can only speculate. But what I speculate is that there were three things that motivated him. A, I was from the other side of the pond, Atlantic Ocean. And it was very hard to... I'm over here, and he's suing me over here. How am I going to mount a defense? How am I going to put together a defense team? How am I going to uh, move my life over here to fight this, etc.? He offered to settle with me for 500 pounds, which I refused. Um, was go to go to a charity of his choice. So that immediately I could just see on the Holocaust on our website, you know. No, but it didn't matter what the charity was. Um, I wasn't going to settle. There's certain, pe certain, uh, certain things you settle, but certain things you don't settle with. So A, I was from the other side of the pond. B, I was a woman, and he's a terrible, he's a misogynist. It's not, it's not surprising. I'm finding increasingly that anti-Semitism and misogyny, I mean, we've long known this, but there are even more examples in the past couple of months of how they dovetail so strongly. Um, so I was a woman. And third of all, I was a Jew. I was a Jew who's, you know, I'm known as a, you know, I'm a, just, I'm a woman, I'm a redhead, I'm a Jew. Yeah, I mean, it's part of who I am. I'm affiliated, I'm et cetera, et cetera. And he assumed that by going after me, he could go after Jews in general, the Jewish community. He wanted to prove that there was a conspiracy against him, that they're out to get me. Um, and he brought in a person who parades himself as an expert. I don't think the judge, you know, gave him a half hour on the stand and then sort of, you know, didn't have didn't think very much of him. Uh, a professor from uh, uh, emeritus now, no longer there, um, Cal State Long Beach, um, who was to prove that I was part of a bigger conspiracy, which I wasn't. Um, and what he, with newspaper clippings. Well, this newspaper says she spoke at this meeting of a Jewish organization, or this, news, this newspaper says that this Jewish organization was promoting her book or something like that. Of course, I was doing many in non-Jewish settings as well, but that didn't matter to them. And the judge kept saying, yeah, but show that she's part of the conspiracy. Just don't show me newspaper articles. And, and you know, then Irving questioned for about a half an hour and then turned to my barrister and said, Mr. Rampton, you're a witness. And uh, Rampton um, just said, I have no questions for this witness. I mean, he had looked so, it looked so silly, you know, that it just, it just... Um, but I think that was part of it. That was part of it in a great measure. Yeah. Other? No? Um, I remember having a talk with some teachers who were at a UNESCO conference. And they were mentioning how there's an increase of um, complex theories and how there's an increase in conspiracy theories and people who believe to it. And that also leads to a rise in anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And how do you relate this to, like, Softcore denial. Oh, it's it's, it's and part of right. It's part of it. It's part of it in a very very uh, overt fashion. Um, the softcore denial is making a number of arguments. Oh, the Holocaust wasn't so bad. There they go talking about the Holocaust again. Enough on the Holocaust, et cetera, et cetera. Now some people talk about it a lot and in inappropriate ways. But when you're talking about a genocide committed in, in the lifetime of people who are still on this earth, um, in which one out of every three people of a group is murdered, um, it's hard to say too much. I mean, like, people say, well, why don't we talk about slavery more? And I say, exactly, we should be talking about slavery more. We should be talking about the Armenian genocide more. If there's any way that these things are going to be prevented from recurring, we should be talking about them. So one is to diminish it. Oh, it wasn't so bad. There they go again to make jokes about it. Um, you see memes. You see all sorts of things on the Internet making jokes about it. 
Um, you see, as I mentioned earlier, with Ken Livingstone, um, you know, saying, oh, this was all, the Zionists were in on this because they wanted to, you know, uh, get all the Jews to move to Palestine. It makes no sense. It isn't true. Uh, the Mufti was a, a much, uh, was a compatriot of, of the Germans. The Germans had no desire for a, a Jewish state or a Jewish enclave in Palestine. Um, but but it, it it is tied up in that, and it's become part of the trope of how, of anti-Semitism that we see today. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Um, but how can we address it? Because in a sense, a hardcore denier, it's easier to bring. As you said, you don't do history in court, but you can more easily address them and show how they're yeah, wrong. Yeah, you can address them with the, knowing the facts. Um, uh, could you bring up my TED talk on? Uh, um, uh, you can address them by knowing the facts. You can also address them by showing the illogic in their argument. Uh, the illogic in their argument. For instance, um, one of the arguments deniers will make is that uh, the Germans were so efficient at what they wanted to do and so accomplished in getting what they... No, don't play it. Just, uh, in getting what they, um, what they... Could you just go back? No, that's not... Uh, yeah, okay, don't, just, just, there you go. Um, I, I addressed that in the, in the, in the TED Talk, um, which I think you're supposed to look at for next week, uh, but, um, basically, you can go after the illogic. So one of the things they say the Germans were so, uh, efficient in what they wanted to do, that they never would have allowed, uh, victims to remain alive, people who were in Auschwitz, people who were in some of the other camps, mainly most of the survivors are from Auschwitz, but a few are from the other camps, to give evidence, to say, we saw this happen, we worked in the gas chambers, we know what happened, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the very fact that people claim that they were there and they saw these things proves that they're lying, because the Germans were so efficient they never would have allowed that to happen. So find the fallacy in that, in my, in that argument. Find the fallacy. What's, what the Germans were so efficient, they would never have allowed that to happen. When they wanted something to happen, they made sure it happened. What else did they possibly want to happen? Alice? They wanted to win the war. Right. They lost that. Yeah, so there you go. You could start from there and move down the... Thank you. Exactly. So it's a, it's a, false, it's a false claim. And you can, you can do that over and over again. Matthew? Yeah, if I can jump on what, um, the question that Alex, uh, Alexander was asking... Um, I mean, sites like h.org exist for a reason right. and ask to try to fight against things. It's our like, webmaster. Matthew is yeah, the webmaster I, of H. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to fight against things like the, the, uh, the Institute for Historical Review's mm -hmm. own website. I mean, mm -hmm. you, will, you might be shocked by this, but we, const uh, we have started to just tell students when we teach classes like this or mm -hmm. other Holocaust classes, mm -hmm. um, don't use this one website for sure. Right, okay? right. There are many websites not to use, but definitely don't use this one. Because always there's a number of students who will cite it thinking that they're citing that's something right. legitimate, See, they, but they don't know how to... Right. If, if, at one point, if you brought, put in Anne Frank into, the, into, the Google, into a search engine, like the third thing that would come up would be a Holocaust denial site or something like that. So you've got to know your facts. You can look for the illogic. And you can also say, listen, for, to, maybe, and maybe to end with this, um, for the deniers to be right, who has to be wrong? Going back to where we started. Holocaust, the, the thousands of documents, German documents, authentic German documents documenting what happened. We just looked at two today, a portion of two today. The victims. This is what happened to me. Different stories, different details, but enough so that, you know, you've got to say there's a body of evidence here. The bystanders, the people in the, in the towns and villages around the camps. The perpetrators. Never said we didn't do it. You know, never once in any war crimes trial did a perpetrator say, I didn't do it. I, I didn't say it didn't happen. They said, I didn't do it. I was forced, but not that it didn't happen. And finally, the thousands of historians who differ with one another. Remember, we're not arguing about a Holocaust orthodoxy. In this class, we've gone over things. This historian says that. That historian says this. This historian says Hitler was motivated primarily by anti-Semitism. Others say, no, he's, uh, he was motivated by expansion and wanting uh, to make sure that Germany would always have enough food or whatever it might be. 
You know, we, we, we will argue about many things, but not whether it happened. So I think that that, so knowing your facts, but also recognizing that this is a conspiracy theory. A conspiracy theory that, don't get into a debate with them. Because debating Holocaust deniers is like trying to nail a blob of jelly to the wall. They make things up. They, they, they're always, you know, inventing and making up, et cetera, et cetera. You've got to know the facts. It took a lot of work to, to expose all those, those misstatements. In fact, this website is in part an effort to do that. Um, but uh, also to recognize it for what it is, and that is a form of anti-Semitism. Okay, any other questions or comments or whatever? Okay. Yes, um, please. I'm curious how much you think the rise of um, conspiracy theories like Holocaust deniers is due to the web and the different way that people are getting their information now? I think the web, I mean, I love the web. I couldn't do my work on the web. You're going to work on the web. I know that's your, that's your, that's your, your area. Um, but it has facilitated it. It has enabled, um, you know, if we move into the contemporary period and we look at some of the tragedies of the contemporary period, uh, just in the past, I don't know, 24 months, Charlottesville, killing of a spectator um, by a white supremacist extremist, Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston, um, another white supremacist extremist, Pittsburgh, um, with the murder of the Jews in, in the synagogue, Christchurch, um, uh, in the murders in the mosque, and there are others that I haven't even mentioned. Um, they all, they're, they're, at one time we might have called them lone wolves. This one is here and that one's there. They're not part of one organization. There's not a central uh, operating, um, telling them, okay, you go there, you go here, etc. But they're not lone wolves. They all read the same material. They have the same uh, logos, numbers, you know, symbols. They all share them. They uh, all go back. That many of them cite back to the um, so-called manifesto, hardly a manifesto in most cases, of the, uh, uh, the, the man in, in Norway who murdered 77 people, many of them children, uh, young people, um, on an island in a, in a, in a, in a camp uh, um, uh, of white supremacists connected with one another. And part of that white supremacy extremism um, is this notion of there is a uh, a gen white Christian genocide that is brewing the desire to 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 wipe out white Christians, white Christian culture, um, and who is responsible for it? In fact, think back to Charlottesville. Think back to the marches. What were they chanting? Jews will not replace us. What do they mean? Jews will not replace us. It's replacement theory. That's part of this. That there is this white. Um, Christian genocide that is in the offing already taking place and you see hordes of swarms or whatever they're called, inf infestation of refugees coming to the southern uh, border of the United States uh, you see an African American as president of the United States, you see all these people emerging into positions of power, well the racist white supremacist says those people are not smart enough to do this on their own. Those people are not talented enough to do this on their own. That's speaking in the name of the white supremacist. Someone must be behind them. Someone must be manipulating them. Someone must be enabling them. Who is that? The Jew. Because the Jew is wily, says the anti-Semite. The racist, the racist punches down, the anti-Semite punches up. Um, and it's the same person. It's the same part of the same conglomerate. And, and misogyny is in there, too. You know, um, so that that's, that's, it's, it, it, it is facilitated by the web. I think that the search engines, I am not a specialist in this area. Maybe you'll go on to a career doing this. Have to figure out a way of really controlling it because right now it's a free-for-all and it allows for these things to happen. And one group cite, one killer cites the other. One, one uh, we were just looking at an article from the New York Times from this past week where they showed the, how the uh, guy in Christ Church is citing the guy in Norway, citing the guy here, citing, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a connection. Other questions or comments? Yes? After 
this case, did Irving continue denying the Holocaust? Yes, yes, yes. Um, he, said, he said it on television. I mean, it, it's depicted in the movie. Um, he went on denying. Um, and uh, But I've stopped paying much attention to him. He's going to, you know, you hear things that he's doing or whatever, but he took up seven years, six years of my life. That was enough. But, like, you won the case. Wasn't he, you know, he felt... Overwhelmed by everything, or no? You're 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 supposing a rational reaction. No, I'm I'm being dead serious here. He went on denying that he actually lost. The yes, trial. he. That's right. He said, "Oh, I didn't lose. The judge just didn't understand." You know. So, as my lawyer said before, he was a Holocaust denier. Now he's a Holocaust denier and a judgment denier. So. Didn't he used to believe in the Holocaust? Yes, he, he, he changes in 88. He changes during something called the Zundel trial. And many pe some people have supposed that he changed because it was a way of getting attention. It was a way of making a splash. And he, is, he lives and breathes attention. Yeah, so that's it. Yeah. Does he recognize that he's a denier now? Yes, you can now say David Irving Holocaust denier yes, but because of the trial. Because of the trial. Oh, okay. yeah, so. You won't get sued. Internet. Let's hope. Certainly, maybe, I don't know, I'll be there by your side if you want. A lot of good that'll do. Any other questions? Okay, thank you all very much. You can watch Lectures in History every weekend on American History TV. We take you inside college classrooms to learn about topics ranging from the American Revolution to 9-11. That's Saturday at 8 p.m. and midnight Eastern on C-SPAN 3.